thanks again, Masia, for accepting our invitation to speak at Korea DEFCON. We're happy to have you. Stage is yours. Um, first of all, thank you for attending the session. Uh, before I begin, um, I would like to make a small clarification. What I will show you is not a Cormedia product. Cormedia has its own um, software as a service offering, so there may be um, confusion about the wording. Cormedia is using Cormedia on cloud, and what I will show you is have a customized version deploying into the cloud wherever the cloud is. Okay, this is not a SaaS offering from Cormedia. Um, okay, my name is Marzia Igani. I am developing Cormedia for about 13 years now, and um, I have all roles um, actually um, as a business analyst, as an architect, as a developer, as a project manager. So um, um, in the last couple of years, I have made a lot of things uh, based on Comedia and Docker and cloud. Um, I will explain you what we have done, what the solution is, what the results are, and, and what we have achieved and what the actual status of the project is. Um, the project is titled, or the sl slides are titled, Comedia Infrastructure Automa Automation and Continuous Delivery. Um, so basically, what this means is that we can spin up complete environments, no matter of if development or staging, test, or production, uh, basically within 15 minutes. Because we have uh, automated every part of the deployment, uh, we use heavily um, infrastructure as code, and so it's possible to deploy um, into any cloud, if it's uh, AWS or Azure or even on-premise, um, because the underlying cloud ar architecture or provider is um, abstracted away uh, by a means, uh, what is called a cluster. A cluster, as a product we use, uh, you see it here on this slide, either Mesos, uh, or Kubernetes. Uh, actually, we have bo both solutions. I have uh, showcases for both. Uh, what we have experienced with Mesos is Mesos is um, a product from one single company called Mesosphere. And this might be a little bit dangerous to go with them because you don't know what happens with them. They are heavily baked by Microsoft. And um, if they won't get funded anymore, then they will disappear. And Kubernetes is, uh, had its uh, roots from Google. Google has about uh, 10 years experience and built this tool internally until they uh, gave it to the open source community a couple of years ago and has great demand and great community support. So this is why we switched initially from, from Mesos now to Kubernetes. Um, what we also have in our showcase is um, the deployment on AWS. I would have loved to show you the, um, the showcase here right now live, but I had some issues with my um, internet connection, especially I need a couple of ports and SSH protocols, so this was not possible. So I'm talking only on slides, but at the end there is a link if you would like to see it in action, because I think seeing is believing. and. Um, uh, if you would like to see the session, it takes 30 minutes uh, to spin up a cluster and show you all, um, then simply register at that link and we have, can have a one-on-one -on -one WebEx session. Um, what are the goals and what are the solutions, how we can achieve the, uh, those goals? Uh, let's start. Um, one goal, or the first goal, is the bootstrapping of a complete Comedia environment. Everybody who is involved in operations and administrations of Comedia components know it's not uh, Comedia relevant. It's also relevant to every architecture which has multiple components, complex components, which has interdependencies, connections, and so on. Um, at first, you have to have capacity planning. You have to know traffics. Um, how many users, and so on and so forth. Then you make a capacity planning, then you order hardware, you wait for the hardware, you install the components. This can take from days to weeks or even months, depending on how many environments you are spinning up. Um, so one goal is bootstrapping full automated. That means with a click of a button or invocation of a command, bootstrap a complete environment somewhere on-premise or cloud. Um, then the second goal is, what if I have the initial cluster? What then? 
uh, basically the developers start to experiment with the environment, play to play with the templates, begin with coding. So basically, if this is set up after 30 minutes, the developers could start. Um, but of course, this whole environment, especially production, but also stage and development, has to be operated. Um, but operated means new deployments, um, deployments of the uh, complete chain, um, like um, content server, master life server, uh, replication life servers, and other deployments uh, involve maybe only the, the uh, CAEs. Um, and what we want to achieve is a zero downtime deployment. This is not possible for every component because um, you cannot scale um, a co content server horizontally but only vertically, so it's not possible to shut it down and, and have another instance running at the same time. So not every component is possible with, with zero downtime deployments, but at least front-end features which you deploy into the CIA, it's very good possible. Uh, so we want blue-green deployments. This, uh, by the way, this is what I mean with automation as much as possible. I don't know what happened. Okay. Um, automation as much as possible because uh, I cannot automate everything. As I said, uh, in certain scenarios, you have to um, do a manual deployment like shutting down the content server, deploy the new version, spinning it up, but other components are dependent. You have to take care of them. Uh, if you want and you force it, you can automate that too, but um, some components may be critical to automate. Um, what we want to achieve is basically um, called a blue-green deployment. Blue-green deployment means that, uh, imagine you have two uh, running CAE instances and um, you want to deploy a new version. What the system does is spin up two new instances and uh, wait until they become healthy. So there is a means of health checks. You can implement health checks as you uh, regard that something is healthy. It can be catching a, a 200 response from the HTTP server or whatever. Um, so at some point in time, the cluster knows that the instances are healthy. It will shut down the old instances and route the traffic through a HA proxy to the new instances. So you won't um, get, you don't have a downtime. This is what blue-green deployments are used for. You can even have canary releases. That means that um, you route only traffic from a load branch, which is in front of the CAEs. Um, a certain percentage of the traffic, maybe 5% or 10% to the new versions, and the rest, the 90%, to the old versions. And then you can test and see how the new CAEs will, will behave. And if you are confident that they are doing well, you can switch the other 90% to the new instances and shut down the old ones. Uh, this is all possible. The last thing we want to achieve is self-healing and auto-scaling. Self-healing means simply that if one instance becomes unhealthy, why ever, maybe the node is down, the hardware node is down, or they say itself does not respond in a certain amount of time, then it's considered unhealthy. And what the cluster does is to shut this instance off, if it can, and um, uh, spin up a new instance of the CAE on another node. Um, this is, can be done completely automatically through the cluster software we use. Um, and also auto-scaling. There is, for example, um, a connection from, from Kubernetes, the cluster software we use, to, for example, AWS. And if such things happen, then Kubernetes is able to even start a new EC2 instance, deploy itself onto it, the, the cluster node, it will become part of the cluster and then deploy the new CAA onto it. So every uh, possible, uh, everything is possible with auto-scaling based on Kubernetes and AWS auto-scaling groups. Uh, what is the solution to all this? Um, who of you guys have, has heard of Docker? Oh, quite a lot. Who is using Docker? Quite a lot. In production? Oh, wow. Very good. Okay. Um, so, nonetheless, I will try to explain the basics of, of uh, Docker. You can uh, read whole books about it. Uh, but I will explain the basics and so that you see why Docker is the right solution for this task. 
Um, at the heart of the solution are Docker images. Um, why Docker? Docker is a form of virtualization, but a lightweight virtualization. I will come to this later, why lightweight? Um, it can isolate application or complete stacks of applications. Uh, it can avoid divergence of environments. Um, that means, basically, if you have normal hardware nodes, then um, operations, the guy from operations, um, will install software on it. They will install libraries on these machines. Then, after a certain period of time, let's say they have 10 of them, then after a certain amount of time, they will install patches on some of them or install new libraries because some developer want a special software or something special than the operations is installing on that machine and all other machines are now different. This is a phenomenon called snowflake servers. So um, with time, this, these servers will diverge and uh, if you are not disciplined enough or have not automated everything, to have everything in sync. And this is what Docker solves, because it, um, if you have created a Docker image, I will come to this later, and you can deploy this image on any hardware node, basically, um, and it sees the same files, it sees the same environment, and you do the installation, the patches, or whatever you want inside this image, and you deploy this image to the different hardware nodes and, and run it from there, and it's always the same. So the point is isolation. Uh, in the next slide, we will see more about, uh, about isolation. And uh, you can reproduce the same thing, no matter if it's one or two servers or 1,000 nodes. It's always the same, always the same environment, always the same files. Um, let's see what the problem actually is. Um, I won't say was, because a lot of applications are actually monolithic applications and why it's, it's basically a good match with, with Docker or which problems Docker solve. Uh, to the left, you see the monolithic application, which consists of different components. And um, what you or what operations does is to install libraries which these applications need. Mostly, of course, these applications um, or even these libraries are dynamically bound. That means um, no static bound libraries, so that there will be dependencies between libraries. Um, if you have one host, one hardware, and one monolithic app, it's basically easy for the operations part because they only need one set of libraries which fulfills the needs of this, this application. But now we have the concept of microservices, which, which is emerging. Uh, and what microservices propose is to um, separate the concerns of the application, separate it into smaller services, which you see here as app one, two, three, and four. Um, the, the advantage of this is, of course, that you can develop these components independently from each other. You can deploy them independently from each other. It has a lot of advantages. But what that implies is that, why does this flash? <laughs> Okay, um, what this implies is that now different applications, as they are now independent services and also diverge because they are um, deployed at different times and with different needs, we will have a dependency held with the libraries. Um, and even and by micro, uh, in microservices, there is a, um, a notion of polyglot programming. That means each application component can theoretically be developed in different programming languages. And then you have even more libraries which you have to take care of and, and be aware of interdependencies. And this is exactly what, where Docker com comes in and solves the situation, because you install all this once in an image, and then you can deploy this whole container, which is it called if you run an image, uh, onto different hardware nodes. Um, think of it as, um, it is basically like a virtual machine, which you know from VMware. But what is different is this year, um, in, usually you, you have, if you have, a, this is a hardware node, um, you have your hardware components, you have the host operating system, and um, you have the hyper hypervisor. This hypervisor is responsible for sharing resources between these different 4M images. 
you see that each VM image has the complete guest OS system, whatever it is. Um, so you, and this is basically why it is called lightweight, because in Docker, uh, each call from the applications um, uses system calls to, to uh, apply for CPU resources or file system resources. And these system calls are going directly through the kernel which is installed on the operating system on that machine. Uh, and here I have different kernels, basically complete operating systems, uh, which has to talk through the hypervisor to the operating system. And this is why it's called um, lightweight. Um, lightweight also because you don't boot such a system, such a Docker image, because it relies on the already running host operating system. So it is instantly there. Um, yeah, basically that is the difference between these two virtual, uh, virtualization technologies. There are also, of course, a lot more differences, subtle differences, but um, this is not for this session. If you have built such an image, such a Docker image, um, you can upload it to a repository. Um, there is a repository, an official repository from Docker Inc., uh, which is called Docker Hub. That means um, you can upload your image there. Everybody can upload his image there. There are official images. Let's say you need an engine X. Then you simply download this image or pull it and run it, and then you have the engine X. If you need a Redis server, you pull this, run it, you have a Redis with a complete configured environment. You don't have to configure it yourself. Of course, uh, with file systems and everything what you want customized, but that's it. You can, these images can be very complex. Yeah? This is um, uh, uh, only in Nginx or Redis or, or in Ubuntu, but the stack which is within the image can be complex so that you basically set this up once and then you have an image which you can run a lot of times. Um, Maybe. Um, this is a private Docker Hub, so if you pay a couple of bucks, um, you can have your own private repositories uh, where you can upload your images, your Docker images to the Docker Hub. Um, why we need a central repository? Because the workflow you will see later is, for example, I can build a Docker image from local source files, push this image to a low, um, hosted repository and pull it from another node, a Jenkins which is running into the cloud, or an AWS or Kubernetes which pulls the image from a central repository. You don't have to use the central repo from Docker Hub. Um, you can download a Docker registry, which is uh, called, and run it on your own node so that it is not exposed to the outer world if you have security issues with this. And even this Docker repository is running itself inside a Docker image, so basically you pull, run, and you have a Docker registry. What next? This was Docker, but Docker alone is not the solution. It is the basic, the building block for, for the solution. The next thing is orchestration, because if I have individual images, then what I can do is to start these images, which are then called containers, and interconnect them. I can set up a networking and say container A must be able to speak with container B. Um, and container B must be able to um, connect to a database which is also running in, in, inside a container. I can do this all manually, or I can use a cluster orchestration tool. There are a couple of them. Uh, first uh, and foremost is Docker Swarm, which is basically also from Docker Inc., but it is not mature enough now for production use. Uh, I have Docker Compose, um, which is basically needed for local uh, installations. If you want to spin up a cluster um, or um, cluster of Docker nodes onto, um, uh, from your local machine, then probably you will use Docker Compose because it's very easy to set up. You will have a YAML file where you can describe which Docker images you want, how they have to talk to each other, um, which ports must be open and so on. And uh, from these YAML files, Docker Compose will spin up all your pull and, and run all your containers with properly configured uh, <laughs> configuration uh, var variables. But for, um, for um, production use, uh, you must take something more heavy. Uh, this is uh, what I um, uh, spoke about 
couple of minutes ago, we have used DCOS, which is Data Center Operating System. Um, this is a new name for Mesos. Mesos is actually from Apache, an open source project. Mesosphere has taken this, built something on top, and called it a Data Center Operating System. But basically, it's, it's Mesos. Um, the other cluster orchestration tool is Kubernetes, um, Docker Swarm, and there is also another one called Rancher. But if you want to run this in production, you have to use uh, Mesos or Kubernetes. Uh, what this, these tools does not simply orchestrate um, the images. That means um, I can define, as I said, exactly the same as in Swarm. I can configure which images I need. We will also see an um, uh, uh, example of such a file. But they do a lot more. For example, um, they do networking. Um, they do um, security tasks. You can configure the network which all these containers run in. Um, and you can configure inbound rules and outbound rules of traffic. So there is a lot to, uh, what these uh, cluster, clusters or container orchestrators do besides of only orchestrating Docker components. Um, this is basically how Kubernetes works. Um, you install something on your local machine. This is the client. The client will talk to a thing called API server. This is running on a master node. You can um, uh, Kubernetes is a master uh, slave uh, operational cluster. That means you, have, you can have any number of masters. For high availability reasons, of course, you will more, use more than one master. And this master is responsible for scheduling uh, deployments and creation of network security and everything um, uh, to deploy everything on individual nodes. Um, and what I do is, for example, if I have installed the, the command line interface, I will talk to this guy here, which is the API server. Um, I will give him the description, this YAML file, of what I want. And he is responsible to figure out, for example, which node would actually be best to deploy my, um, my, t my, my image onto. This is the responsibility of the cluster manager. That means, in a YAML file, you say, for example, hey, I have a content server. For this, I need three gigabyte of RAM and um, 10 gigabyte of this space. And the cluster manager will figure out um, which node has this capacity and will um, decide himself where to deploy this, this pod. You don't have anything to do with this. This is the responsibility of the cluster manager. Um, and if you want to expand all this, you just set up a new hardware node, install Kubernetes on it. And then it will auto discover his master and uh, add himself as a node to the cluster manager. And the cluster manager now, from now on, knows that he has another node with resource, free resources and can distribute the load among all these nodes. <clears throat> um, what I also told you is that all this can be achieved, or basically, this is the reason why it can be achieved. Um, is because we can describe infrastructure and, and application components as code. Um, this is, for example, an um, excerpt of the CloudFormation JSON template. Uh, basically, this small guy is 2,500 lines long. It's a JSON file with 2,500 uh, lines which describes the complete infrastructure I need on AWS to run the Comedia components. If I run this in CloudFormation, uh, then it will spin up the complete components on AWS, everything I need, uh, load balancers, elastic load balancers, an RDS instance, elastic block storages, the EC2 instances, install the Kubernetes software on that. Uh, all just from invoking this JSON template. If you, it is a lot of work to, to do this, but if you have this, then you can make a thousand clusters from it. Every customer can use exactly this file to run a Comedia cluster. Um, so basically, initially, it's a lot of work. It depends, of course, on also on uh, your security needs, for example. There is a lot to security. If you run AWS, for example, if, do you want to have fail over or high availability over different regions or over different availability zones, which is equal to data centers. 
um, there, there is a lot to consider if, for example, you use auto-scaling groups and some node is down and is spin up again, it will get a new IP. So you have to take care of this and, and build this into your infrastructure. Uh, this is a basic infrastructure which will work for, uh, I would say, every, everything with, um, besides production. For production, it heavily depends on your needs. But if the customer says, okay, this is okay for my production, need, okay, but I need only one or two more EC2 instances to balance the load better, then of course it's just a small change in the number and then it will simply spin up two instances more. Um, this is a file from Kubernetes. The other, was, uh, the other one, the former one, was from uh, CloudFormation, uh, which is basically a template infrastructure spin-up tool from Amazon. And this uh, uh, file is an example of uh, a Kubernetes YAML file. That means if I invoke my, my uh, Kubernetes um, client, then I will give him this file, and he will send this file to the, to the uh, API server, and it will figure out what to install where. For example, I have um, an image named Content Server CMS Showcase. What Kubernetes will do is figure out which um, requirements I have. For example, I want one instance, I want uh, two gigabytes of, of memory and so on, figure out which node to deploy, give this to the node, and the node will pull, go to my Docker repository, pull the image, and start the container with, with um, that configuration. And also connect um, the containers as I have defined it here. Yeah, so after I initiate this, basically it's uh, a lot longer, it's only a, a small portion. But if I invoke that command, then I have installed the complete, one complete Comedia environment or stack onto the cluster. So basically two commands. Um, we have used AWS because, in my opinion, it's, it's the most major cloud provider. Uh, of course, there is Google, of course, there is Microsoft, but um, we have chosen AWS because we had the most knowledge in it to build this showcase. Mm. This is a general architecture. It, it doesn't contain all Comedia components, but just for you to get, to get um, um, a, a small idea how it works. Um, we have um, an AWS load balancer. We have a VPC where we have all instances separated from every other cloud. Um, we have a HA proxy as a basic entry point, which will balance the load between different uh, slaves, which in this case are uh, CIA, CIA, CAEs. And in our showcase, what we do is, for example, go um, and kill one of these containers manually through the command line and, and show how the cluster um, notice it and invoke another instance or on, on another server. Um, and as I said, this works with, with Mesos and, and Kubernetes. Uh, and this is our continuous delivery workflow, because each, if we have such an architecture in place, then we can do other stuff with it like continuous delivery. Um, the workflow is such, we have for um, uh, test and, and uh, development, um, we commit something into Git, it's no matter if it's GitLab, Bitbucket, GitHub, we have a trigger on this, so Jenkins uh, notice it, that something is pushed, it will check out the code, build it with Maven, uh, it checks out the blueprint code, builds it with Maven, push, pushes the image which it has built, there is a Docker file which I will show you, invoke this Docker file, build the image, push the image to the repo, uh, and invoke a Kubernetes or Mesos command for deployment. And um, Mesos again, or Kubernetes, will pull the image, which I have, for example, tagged with a build tag, pull the image and run it. And true um, um, blue-green deployment, that means in case of CAE, I have no downtime. If I want to roll back, if there is a problem which arises which I don't notice immediately, then the rollback is just simply change a number and invoke another command, namely, I use another image, uh, because images can be tagged like code, um, 
I can specify the former image, the image before I deployed, and deploy that. There's basically two commands, and it will deploy all itself with the previous version of the code. Uh, this is the Docker file, basically for one component, the content server. Um, as you see, it's very easy. I, I won't explain what, what all this does. Um, I just want to show you that we use the uh, zip artifacts which the Comedia, basic Comedia build will generate. Uh, we use this artifact, we, ex we um, unzip it, um, and run a little wrapper script around this, this uh, uh, Tomcat, which, which will then start. And what this, this wrapper script does is to invoke the reconfigure script from also Comedia. Uh, we have modified this reconfigure script. I, I think you're all familiar with this post-configure, pre-configure stuff uh, from the workspace, Maven workspace. Um, what reconfigure does is based on environment variables in in files which are located in etc comedia um, to replace those variables with uh, comedia um, files uh, for the runtime and we have a small change we read these variables not from files but through environment variables so that means you can take the same uh, docker image and run it in dev or stage or whatever and only through the environment variables which you invoke the docker image with um, you can have the same binary image differ uh, behaving differently based on the environment it is running in. Um, so basically that's all, it's a Docker file. Yeah? We, and this is the wrapper script and you see we have this um, Docker config which does basically exactly the same thing as the reconfigure but uh, getting its source variables from the environment instead of files. What are the results? Uh, results, what we have achieved with this is instead, a couple of you guys, I think I have shown this already, uh, is bootstrapping complete comedy environment in 30 minutes. Basically, if I don't talk, then it's only 15 minutes. Um, we can have self-healing out of the box, uh, zero downtime deployments, aka blue-green deployments out of the box. We have monitoring in, pr uh, in place with Prometheus and Grafana. Uh, we have a log aggregator with Elasticsearch, Kibana, and Fluent D. Uh, you know all these Comedia components generate a lot of logs. And uh, for operations, if you have an error or you want to see how the system behaves, you have to log in into different systems and look at the log files. And what this tech does is just to aggregate, take all log files from the different places index them in Elasticsearch and have a dashboard named uh, uh, Kibana, uh, and you can see the results, all log files in one place. You can search for them, you can uh, set alerts um, if, for example, special error arises that someone will get uh, an email or such things. And we have also the continuous delivery pipeline with Jenkins also out of the box. Um, as I said, I would have liked to show it live, but uh, if you want to see it live, just go to this link, uh, bit.ly cm underscore Webex, schedule a meeting with me, and I can show it uh, on a Webex session. And if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, this is my LinkedIn. That's basically it. Thank you very much. <laughs> if you have questions, then in the other room is a QA session, so I would be more than happy to answer questions.